Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA is a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. For more than 60 years, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has held to a singular and enduring mission to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. Working with innovators inside and outside of government, DARPA has repeatedly delivered on that mission, transforming revolutionary concepts and even seeming impossibilities into practical capabilities. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's programs and partners. My name is Randy Atkins, and I'll be your DARPA host today. One of the things that DARPA does well is develop technologies that have clear military benefit, where the military is able to make that initial investment and mature the technology to the point that it is ready for adoption in civil society. The internet's a great example of that. It was developed as a way to share research between institutions that were doing military research. And now what we're seeing is that we believe that we can develop an analogous energy web network that could have great applications for civilian use. Looking at all the things that are out there in terms of different ways to generate energy, to store energy, or to distribute energy, can we now optimize that by adding another tool to the tool set, which is wireless power transfer? Colonel Paul Calhoun, now a DARPA program manager, served as a pilot in numerous war zones. It was a mobility pilot where we were always looking at the tyranny of distance. I was supporting special operations, but also just moving equipment and fuel and things all around our areas of responsibility in those combat zones. And from that, I started to recognize that some of the things that we do in military situations don't make sense when you're just looking at it from how you would do things at home. And one of the real examples of that is I was often tasked with airdropping fuel to forward operating bases across Afghanistan. And as we'd airdrop that fuel, you know, we'd deliver four or five barrels of JP-8 fuel by parachute. And to do that mission, we'd burn more than 150,000 pounds of fuel. And not to mention, you know, that's just cost. What was even more significant is we were being fired at and there was risk that was associated with the aircraft and the crew. And so I recognized through that experience that moving fuel is absolutely vital to what we're trying to do as a military. And the way that we do it now is dangerous and not particularly efficient, but it's the best way that we possibly have. Calhoun envisions a better way one in which various air vehicle platforms don't need to carry much, if any, fuel, because it would be beamed to them. He started to DARP a program called POWER. POWER is the first meaningful step that we are taking towards this, what I like to call, energy web dominance framework. So POWER itself stands for Persistent Optical Wireless Energy Relay. And what POWER is looking to do, it's looking to move energy over long distances, hundreds of kilometers, through the high altitude using optical wireless power beaming, or lasers, in order to move energy through the stratosphere, beaming the energy up to the platform without having to store all of it on board. And if they can do it? You're able to have a very small platform that's able to have significant performance, like unlimited endurance or unlimited range. Calhoun says the key to making power successful, and the DARPA hard part, is engineering relays that can efficiently direct laser beam photons even as they navigate turbulent weather conditions. So something that's able to take energy in and then redirect it accurately and intelligently without having significant losses. We need it to correct any aberrations that happen to the wavefront as it's coming through the atmosphere. We need to have very concentrated beams. So all of the systems that currently exist to do a function like that have significant losses, which means that they just don't scale out into a multi-hap network. So you could do point-to-point power beaming for very specific scenarios where you built a system directly to just make that one link. But that's a long cry away from actually getting to a network. Getting to this point where you can actually scale across a multi-path network requires effective automatic relays, and that's what we're developing with power. The plan is to have those advanced relays in five years. While it won't completely change our energy systems overnight, Calhoun believes it could have immediate impacts. We've spent trillions and trillions of dollars setting up our wired infrastructure and our pipes infrastructure. It'll be a long time before an idea like this would directly compete with those in terms of efficiency. 
But where it does make sense immediately is places like disaster relief, where the infrastructure is gone, where your alternative is bringing in liquid fuels to burn in generators. All of these things are very inefficient, and we can do better than that. And these are exactly the scenarios, as I pointed out, that the military finds itself in time after time. But Calhoun is looking beyond crisis or military operations, too. His ultimate dream is to make an energy web that's much like our internet information web. I think in terms of a way to think about how this could transform society, it's similar. Now, what we've seen with information is a democratization of information where it's now available to many more people. And our ability as just a normal person to get access to information has vastly improved over the last hundred years. In the same way, we think that the energy web will, by unlocking current places where energy is abundant and free, for example, there's a lot of energy stored in deep ocean waves. The amount of energy that's happening in waves in the middle of the ocean is enough to power the world many times over. But we just can't get to it. It's not convenient. If we could create a network that moves that energy to places of high need, I believe that you'll see a similar thing where the accessibility of energy for the average person will be greatly increased. And with that, productivity. And if we can get to a world where we are no longer tying energy production to carbon, if we're no longer poisoning our environment by production, if it no longer has to be a balance, that's a really exciting place to be because it allows us to unlock production without some of the negative impacts. And there's a lot of different concepts of how to do energy generation if you're able to unlock distribution. So the key to making energy from renewable sources like waves more useful is a new way of moving it. We see the energy web as a distribution solution that unlocks new generation opportunities. There's dozens of really interesting ideas out there in terms of ways to, to generate energy. It's hard to know which ones of those will actually play out economically and technologically. Another popular idea is using solar energy in space. So harnessing the sun's energy, but outside of the atmosphere and then beaming that back down to Earth. This has been something people have talked about for decades, and there's currently a lot of investment looking at the actual physical ways that you would do that. But for that to be practical, you have to figure out this distribution problem. And so for all these different technological ideas of which wave energy is one, space solar energy is one, there's other various concepts there in terms of harnessing other aspects of the Earth's energy. All of those, the missing element to them is that we don't have a good way to move that energy, even if we're able to tap it. So there's plenty of energy out there. It's just how do we get it from where it is to where we need it? Does this have the potential to dramatically reduce or even eliminate liquid hydrocarbon fuels? I mean, I think it's, it's possible. So liquid fuels are flammable, explosive, poisonous. There's a lot of things that liquid fuels don't have going for them. They're heavy to move around. What they're really, really good at is storing energy. The amount of energy that you can store in a pound of liquid fuels is dozens of times greater than even our best battery technologies currently. So that's why we continue to use liquid fuels. There are going to be applications where having that kind of high-density energy storage is more important than distribution, probably always. I think it's going to be a long time before there's no use for liquid fuels. They sure do have their niche. But what we're trying to do is give ourselves more options so that we can think through those different use cases, flexibly solving the distribution challenges. I think that we are seeing trends where electricity is a cleaner, easier energy source across the board, and we'd rather use that. It's safer, less byproducts, chemical byproducts. Electric engines, electric motors are much more maintenance friendly, can be lighter weight. There's a lot of advantages there. They don't have carbon buildup. So we're already seeing sort of an electrification of society and electrification of the military happening. But Calhoun says it's time to direct some efforts beyond electrical generation and storage. What we want to do is look at this problem differently, because we're DARPA, and focus on the distribution part of that. And if we get much better with energy distribution, it helps mitigate some of the challenges we have with storage, and it helps mitigate some of the challenges we have with generation. It opens up new generation sources, and it means that the fact that we aren't particularly good at storing electrical energy stops being such a big problem. We can have smaller batteries in our cars because we can recharge them as we're going down the freeway, for example. And that way you wouldn't have to stop and recharge your battery, which you know for electric vehicles, because they take longer to recharge, starts to be a limitation. How else might this impact the broader society and even be used by civilians at home? We all get annoyed by the fact that our phones lose life all day and then you have to plug them in at night or your Apple Watch does the same. And there's 
plenty of ways to send power to small devices like that because they don't require a whole lot of energy. There's also a convenience factor to this. I personally don't like cords all that much. So if I could just get rid of cords and have my devices charging in my home, I might be willing to accept that it's slightly less efficient than directly plugging it into the wall. So there's a flexibility of being able to not have to tie ourselves to physical connections that has a value in and of itself. There's plenty of ways to do that that are safe and relatively effective in probably the shorter term. In addition to laser beams, Calhoun says a widespread energy web will ultimately look at using microwave and radio frequency energy. I asked him whether all of this is safe. It's a great and fair question, and we have from day one been very focused on the human safety aspect of this. We live in a world where we have lethal amounts of electricity running through every single one of these walls, and we've learned how to deal with that safely through having path monitoring or ground disconnects. In the same way, we're talking about significant amounts of energy that could have human health impact if they weren't handled correctly. We want this to be a system that you could employ in the real world. And for us to employ in the real world, we have to be smart about how we move this energy around people, objects, and natural things that are occurring out there. So we are thinking about that from step one. And any plan that doesn't fully incorporate safety interlocks isn't going to compete well as we're going for a solution. Ultimately, Calhoun adds, this is something we simply need to explore for the future of our planet. As we look at the horizon over dozens of years, decades in the future, this could fundamentally change things as we know it across society. So, so much of our society is tied to our ability to effectively use energy. And what we're trying to do is add a new tool to spread energy to more people more flexibly in order to create a better society, as well as open up a lot of opportunities for the tough challenges that our military has to face. Can we do this in a lightweight system that's not very expensive? Because that's what I require in order to make this scalable network where we might have hundreds or thousands of nodes. It doesn't help me too much if I design a system that can do this that costs millions of dollars. So I think that we can get there. I think that we've got some really good ideas on how to solve that problem in innovative ways. But we should see results here soon. This journey has begun, and we are moving out to go make this reality. With a good, strong DARPA push over the next few years, we think that we can get to a scalable, practical network for the first time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks also to Tom Shortridge for his invaluable partnership in producing this program. For more information on the Power Project or other work at DARPA, please visit DARPA.mil.